Hello, and welcome to this plenary hypothetical as part of the MHPN Altogether Better virtual conference. It's fantastic to see so many of you logged on tonight, and I'm thrilled that you've been able to join us. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia upon which our panellists and our participants are located, and I'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. The Altogether Better conference aims to explore the impact on our lives of the COVID pandemic and a succession of climate related natural disasters. And for this hypothetical tonight, we've assembled a magnificent panel of experts who are going to help us explore these issues and explore the, the layered impacts on, on individuals, on families and on communities. I won't be introducing the panel so I, individually, so I, I really urge you to go to the conference website, have a look at their bios because they really are a stellar group. Over the next hour or so, I'll be introducing various parts of the hypothetical and, and asking our panel uh, to respond. And um, as for you, and as in real life, our panelists are not aware of what's coming up. And so they're going to have to think on their feet. I'm going to have to think on my feet as well. We're all keeping our fingers firmly crossed that the wheels don't fall off. Um, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, you can post to the chat box and our tech people will get back to you straight away. Unfortunately, we're not in a position to respond to any questions or comments regarding the content of tonight's uh, hypothetical. What I'd like to do today as part of this hypothetical is to take you to a small town called Janesville. Janesville is a little rural community, about three hours drive from the nearest city. And like many rural communities, it's a very close knit community. It's, um, it a lot of life tends to revolve around key community hubs like the pub, the footy club, um, the rural fire station at the primary school and so on. Janesville uh, was deeply affected by the COVID uh, pandemic. They had two particular ways, one in 2021, one in 2022, and several of the elderly members of the community perished as a result of those waves. But Janesville's also experienced a number of really serious natural disasters. So two years ago, they in 2021, they had a, a bad bushfire that didn't quite hit the town, but it did destroy a lot of agricultural land nearby, a few houses on the very outskirts of town, a number of farm buildings, livestock uh, were killed and so on, uh, crops were damaged, and a farm labourer, a, a man, died as a result of those fires in 2021. Uh, a year later, in 2022, Janesville was hit by a very bad flood when the, when the river burst its banks and water flowed down the main street and left in its path a trail of, of devastation, albeit not permanent damage, but a terrible mess and took a long time to clear up. But more urgently for us tonight, uh, only a few weeks ago at the end of February, Janesville was hit by a very bad bushfire. Um, basically, the fire was, was heading straight towards the town. Uh, it looked as though it was going to, to actually destroy the whole town. Um, people were told, as, as they usually are in these situations, to either leave now or stay. Some decided to leave, some decided to stay. Uh, when the fire hit the town, it destroyed a number of houses. Um, it destroyed or at least damaged the, the primary school. And it looked as though the whole town was going to be destroyed. But um, somewhat surprisingly and unbeknownst to anyone that it was going to happen, the wind suddenly changed direction and the fire moved away from town. But it was a very serious disaster. As we said, a number of houses were lost, um, livestock were lost, pets were lost. Um, an elderly uh, woman living in a house on her own on the edge of, of town perished when her property was destroyed. And a young volunteer firefighter was very severely injured, severely burned. Uh, when she was caught, when, when the fire changed direction and she was, uh, couldn't get back to her truck or to her team. Um, and so uh, it's really this most recent uh, disaster that the community is struggling to come to terms with now, but, but uh, on the back of all those other disasters. Rob Gordon, I'd like you to, to bring you in if I could. Uh, Rob, you're an expert in disaster recovery. Um, and you've been sent to Janesville as part of the state disaster recovery plan. 
Uh, what are you finding in terms of the impact of this series of disasters on the community of, uh, of Gainesville? Um, thanks, Mark. Look, uh, what, what we're finding is uh, the, the whole place is a buzz. There are people who uh, were very threatened and traumatised. Um, some people who have had bad things happen to them, destroyed property and uh, narrow escapes. But there are a lot of other people who are carrying all the traumas from the previous events. And so all that has been reactivated. So we're seeing a lot of emotion, a lot of anxiety. But within that, there is a core of people who are busily getting the whole uh, environment organised and trying to create as clearly as they can uh, a, uh, an immediate response plan and, uh, and a relief plan. So uh, there are plans to open the hall and to uh, have various groups uh, providing services, but uh, there are people actually just taking the initiatives in all directions just to do what they see as needed. Wonderful. And, and I want to come back to you in just a minute and, and uh, ask about what strategies you might be using. But just for the moment, I'd like to, to bring in Penny. Penny Burns, Penny, you're, you're a very experienced GP. Um, <clears throat> you are the only GP in Jamesville, which, let's face it, is an extremely tough job. Um, have you noticed any changes in your clinical practice over the last few years, but particularly over the last few weeks, in terms of the perhaps the numbers and the, and the types of presentation that you're getting in your practice? So, yes, I have, um, Mark. Over the, over the last period of time, I've been seeing families and people with lots of struggles, ranging some people struggling, other people sort of, um, you know, getting getting the, getting together and moving forward and, and trying to move on to a new life. But during this um, last sort of few weeks, we've actually seen that all slip backwards very quickly. Um, our waiting room on the first morning was full of people. There were people waiting to get into the waiting room to see doctors. Um, there was a lot of distress in the waiting room. Um, people saw that as a safe place. Um, there were people crying. Everyone was aware that people had died and everyone knew um, our little old lady, Mrs Smith, um, and so that was ripping through. We had um, staff members who were affected and one had to rush out as the fire was going through. Um, we, the, there, was, there, was also, there was distress and there was um, a lot of need for calming. And so every patient we were seeing was taking longer. And we were seeing a lot of physical effects as well. So we were seeing both the psychosocial and the mm -hmm. physical. And you raise a very interesting point there. Um, that uh, you, and indeed your staff, but let's think about you for the moment, um, you're not only the person trying to help the community recover, but you are also part of the affected community. How important is it that you look after yourself at this time? It's really important, but we're very, very bad at doing that. I myself am really bad at doing that, and we, we will jump right in. So, you know, what happens to our community affects us personally and professionally, but we will give our all. And so... I'm putting myself on 24 hour call on call so that people can access me because there's no one else in town. The nearest hospital is every several hours away, I believe. Um, and I've got family at home um, that I'm really worried about. So I'm frightened, um, but I also want to be there. I'm sort of driven and I feel responsible to be there for my patients. Um, and it's a, well, I was going to say it's, it's an extremely tough period, isn't it? I'm, I'm sort of cautiously hopeful that by the end of our hypothetical, you'll have made links with some people who might be able to support you as well as the community. Thanks, Penny. Um, Andrew, Andrew Koo, you're a very experienced uh, psychiatrist, uh, long interest in the mental health effects of trauma and so on, but also an interest in rural mental health. And as part of the, the state disaster recovery plan, you may be called on in the future to provide some assistance to the people of Jamesville. At this point, given what you know, um, are you expecting that there might be much in the way of diagnosable psychiatric conditions? Are we going to see a kind of epidemic of, of diagnosable conditions? Well, I think on the background, Mark, of cumulative trauma, uh, traumatic circumstances over a period of time with local loss of life and, and is usually very connected and that social connectedness is very important in rural communities um, as well as a general decreased access to general medical health care as well as mental health care that I think we could reasonably expect that there's going to be quite a notable increase in psychological distress that that Penny's seeing in her rooms and that 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 uh, we've already heard outlined or um, previously. So I think in the context of this increase in general psychological distress and, and angst, 
we could also expect that there'd be an increase in the clinically significant type presentations or diagnosable psychiatric conditions. And of course, but it's important perhaps to make that distinction. Um, I'm very glad that you did, really, that there might be a lot of distress that doesn't necessarily cross the line to, to psychiatric disorder. We don't want to diagnose everybody. Absolutely. And, and we, we often see in these situations, and this has kind of been referred to in a general sense, but in a more sort of, uh, sort of scientific sense, there's just as many people, I guess, are going to show this kind of post-traumatic growth and, and sort of start doing a lot of very strength-based functional things moving forward as people that are going to kind of probably drop their bundles a bit. Hey, fascinating. I hope we'll get a chance to talk about post-traumatic growth, but we'll see how the time goes. Camelia, Camelia Wilkinson, you are um, an education developmental psychologist. You've been working with the education department in, in the broad region of which James, uh, Janesville is a part. Um, on a project for the last couple of years, looking at the impact of COVID and lockdowns on the well-being of children. Um, lockdowns finished a long while ago now. They've been back at school. Are, are we still seeing the effects of that in Janesville Primary, for example? Are we still feeling the effects of the lockdowns? Absolutely, Mark. Um, as the others have suggested, there is a lot of distress with the latest events. However, there's compounded trauma um, indeed. There's been research from Melbourne University, from Royal Children's Hospital, from WA that shows that children have been affected highly by the COVID uh, pandemic. It has left a distinguish distinguishable mark on, on children. The disruption to education, the increased anxiety and stress, increased issues with mental health and depression, the social isolation, just to mention a few issues, the children have been carrying all these worries and have left a mark. And then if you put that in the context of what is recently happening in Janesville, there is also a doubling effect that is happening, reverberating throughout the community. So in terms of what we're trying to look at, with the department is how we can best support the children. Good. I, I will come back to you and talk about that. But um, yes, that's interesting that that, that that you think they're still being affected in, in Janesville Primary at the moment. We'll come back and talk more about that in a minute. Um, Chris, Chris Hall, you're, you're an expert in loss and grief. Um, again, you, you've been um, involved with the State Disaster Recovery Plan allocated to assist Janesville in its recovery. Um, I want to talk to you a bit down the track on, on, on loss of loved ones and so on. But at this point, do you think that a, a, um, a loss and grief paradigm, a loss and grief model has anything to offer the Janesville community in a broader disaster recovery sense? It, it probably won't surprise you to say definitely. Um, and, and I want to put that in some kind of context. So I think historically people have thought about grief in terms of a death-related loss, usually of kin or a family member. Um, uh, and historically, it's been a very individual kind of intrapsychic focus. Um, much has changed in the last two decades. We know that people, that grief can occur really as a result of any significant loss, whether that be a person, a place, a possession, uh, or even an idea, even a sense of safety or order or predictability. Um, and so... Uh, Absolutely. Um, the, the differences in the way people negotiate and navigate their grief is also um, a, a point of both uh, potentially sometimes conflict in communities, as some people uh, have a view that you know, we, we get over these things very quickly, when in fact we know that these losses continue to resonate um, over very long uh, uh, periods of time. And I think the mm -hmm. other thing is that often the way people define themselves as a grieving person, um, and we saw this during Black Saturday, that even when a, a neighbour uh, or somebody down the, the road had, had died, they might not describe themselves as, as bereaved, but in fact uh, are. So, again, the way a community comes together to support itself and to co-create a new kind of meaning, um, I think is a really important part of uh, the grief experience. Sure, sure. And helping them to understand it from that perspective, I'm sure we'll, we'll come back and talk about that more as well. 
<clears throat> um, Kemi, Kemi Wright, you're um, an exercise physiologist with a particular interest in, in mental health. You currently live in the city, but you grew up in Janesville. You were born in the area, grew up in Janesville. You know it very well. You've still got a holiday house there. You know the footy club uh, really well. Um, we call it the footy club. It's actually the football, cricket, netball club, but everyone calls it the footy club, you know. Um, do you think that, that a place like the footy club has um, anything to offer in terms of helping the community recover? Absolutely. I think it's a really vital, um, considering it's a hub for where people, you know, meet and, and engage, I think it can be really useful in terms of recovery, um, both in the immediate sense and long term in creating, uh, you know, a positive community um, environment. It can also create really strong support systems and we can actually use physical activity or, or those kinds of sporting clubs to really, um, you know, help manage some of the distress that the other presenters have talked about in the short term, but also the long term as well. Mm, excellent. I'm a little more sceptical, but I shall come back to you later about that. <laughs> we'll talk about that down the track. Um, thank you, uh, Akemi. Neville, Neville Goddard, you are a, you've been a volunteer firefighter for many years, and much of that time you've been involved in peer support. At the moment, you are the peer support coordinator for the whole region of which Janesville is just one, uh, one particular rural fire station. Mm -hmm. um, this this um, team, this rural fire service, has been through a very tough time recently. How, how do you think it might have affected them? Or how do you think it is affected them? Uh, thanks, Mark. Yeah, I, I would expect a whole range of responses where we're talking about one group of people uh, in, in the fire brigade, uh, but they're all, all individuals. They've all got different things going on in their lives. Um, some of them, while they've been um, fighting the fire, may have lost their own house. Um, there'll be a multitude of different responses within that brigade. Um, they and it may be very different now that it's visited their own home. Uh, a lot of them identify very strongly with the role of firefighter, and and that involves protecting life and property. And if we look around town, and there's property and life lost, that can be devastating for someone who defines themselves as protecting their home, their town, their people from from fire and, and other disasters. So. But, yeah, very, very good point. Very Actually, good point. very large impacts from this latest event, um, which people may have been holding themselves together through the others, but this one could be different to all the others because it's visited our home. Exactly. I, I take the point entirely. I think it's a very important one. It actually leads me nicely onto the next thing that I want to say. Because what I'd like to do now is to introduce you to Jimmy McCoy. Jimmy is a very well-respected um uh, character in, in Janesville. He's about 40 years old. He uh, runs a small car mechanic business in town. He's a very keen football player and he's the captain of the Rural Fire Service. Um, he's got 25 years experience as, as a volunteer firefighter under his belt. Um, in fact, I don't know if I should say this, but the fact is that he is widely known as Mad Jimmy. And I emphasize that he's not known as Mad Jimmy because of any question at all about his mental health. On the contrary, Mad Jimmy is so called because he is tough. He is extremely tough. If ever there's a, a, um, a fight on the football field, it's Mad Jimmy that's straight in there to help his mates. When he's doing his firework or, or, or going to a car accident or whatever, it's always him leading from, from the front. He, he will always put himself in the most dangerous situation. And the fact is that, that um, you know, most people in the town, but certainly the young people, look up to Mad Jimmy as being completely invincible. And the fact is that he has, you know, he's, he's been through all these events for many, many years and never seems to have shown any kind of sign at all of, of mental health problems. He, he, he really is tough. Jimmy is married. He's been married for 15 years to Betty. Betty is a childcare worker and they have two children. They have a son, Jason, who is 12 years old, so he's just started at the nearby high school, but that's in another town. He has to catch a bus to go to this new high school, so he started there only a matter of weeks ago, really. Um, and a daughter, Alice. Alice is 10 years old, and uh, she is still at Janesville Primary School. Rob, can I uh, bring you back in? I'd, I'd like to ask you in a minute whether you've got any reactions to, to um, Jimmy there, but before I do that, let me ask you, what kinds of things you might be doing to um, assist the community of, of, of Janesville in the, in the overall community recovery? 
Um, one of the really important things is to develop a community interface with the recovery systems and the formal systems. Um, one of the difficulties is that people often just get straight about their physical recovery and don't actually participate in the broader activities of the whole community. They can be quite isolated and we notice we noticed in Black Saturday they would often come in in the third and fourth year having uh, really totally exhausted themselves and not availed themselves of any of the support services. So we'd be wanting to, I'd be wanting to access the various uh, uh, nodes of information like the GP and uh, the, I certainly want to get alongside the footy club and help them understand the role they might play. And uh, I'd be wanting to have representatives of recovery uh, registration and support, psychological first aid, anywhere where people gather, even at the rubbish dump, if people are taking the debris from their houses down there, you'd want someone from the council who would be able to start networking. Because the, the international research shows uh, uh, quite clearly the most reliable predictor of the adequacy and speed of recovery is going to be what's called social capital or social networking and linkages. So I'd be wanting to get straight into this as, as actively as we could. And that would mean also getting alongside people who are uh, on adrenaline in high arousal who are on about their business because uh, arousal produces a kind of tunnel vision and people just get the bit between their teeth and they, they do their thing. Uh, maybe not even understanding the, the recovery system around. So I'd be wanting to get meetings and bring these people together mm. to give them roles and to uh, help them uh, see themselves all as part of a, a community-based system. Because um, presumably there's clearly a lot of... Um there's a lot of emotion going around within the community of all kinds, isn't there? And I, I think the point you make is really important in terms of presumably preventing all that emotion, having a destructive effect in, in the community spirit. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, what we know is that um, organisational glitches, bureaucratic insensitivity, uh, conflicts, unavailability, not being heard, all create elevated arousal. Elevated emotion creates elevated arousal. Elevated arousal actually undermines the very cognitive skills you need, which is stopping and being strategic and seeing the whole picture and prioritising. And, and people get into this narrow focus of doing the most concrete thing that mm. seems obvious and, uh, and then, of course, end up cutting across each other and creating conflict. Yeah, yeah, good. All right, thanks for that. Um, can I just get you to comment very quickly, since you've got the floor, if I might as well ask you now, we're going to be talking a lot about Jimmy as this hypothetical unfolds, but do you have any initial reactions to, to Jimmy's? Um, you know, I've met people like Jimmy, and uh, after Black Saturday, there were Jimmys who'd lost their family, and uh, uh, everyone kept saying, uh, shouldn't we be doing something? And they were running around helping. And in one case that I know, the man was not ready to ask for help, until the third year and then he said uh, I think I need some help and I think it's much better to for people to get alongside them and help them uh, support them to do what they want to do in this short term rather than tell them what we think they need because Jimmy's going to need to experience some cracks before he's going to, to step out of uh, mad Jimmy's role mm. of being the uh, the leader uh, and it's very important that we uh, that, that there are networks, and I think a, a, a good strategy is to identify people who can get alongside Jimmy and keep an eye on him, and when he starts to drink too much or whatever, they can start uh, perhaps talking to him about what's available. We'll see what happens with Jimmy in just a minute. Thanks, uh, thanks Rob. Um, Camelia, we, we've talked about the fact that... Um, uh, we've talked about the importance of hubs in the community and, and we talked about the fact that the primary school has been damaged. It was damaged in the floods and it was quite more severely damaged really in, in the recent fires. How important is that physical infrastructure to children? So I'm thinking about Alice, for example, who's 10 years old at the primary school. Do you think she's going to be affected by the fact that her school has been physically damaged? I believe, yes, I believe so. It, it is about social connectedness. Children connect when they go to school. 
um, all the research I made reference to earlier on, um, that's what it shows. COVID has left a mark on children because of the social isolation. Yes, they connected online, but it wasn't the same. When you physically go to school and you interact with your peers and your teachers and other people that are within the school system, it creates like a different world for children. And that gives predictability and it gives them a sense of security. When that is gone, like in, in the case of Janesville with, with the school being affected, it will it has a distinct effect on children. Children struggle um, mm. to connect to their learning, to connect well, to their social peers. Yeah, t just taking that to the next step. Then you you have um, your role has been expanded by the education department now, and they want you to help Janesville Primary School through the recovery process. Just following on from that, is there anything particular that you you are advising the primary school to be doing? Absolutely, finding that place in a physical sense and maybe the talking to Kemi about the footy club will be one thing I would suggest in organizing events or organizing opportunities for children to get together and meet not necessarily to learn I believe with so much trauma and so much going on in children's lives the learning will be very superficial but it's about giving them a sense of predictability and some sort of routine and doing things. So that's what I would be suggesting. That's what I suggested already. Um, and we're just in the uh, preliminary stages of developing an actual plan of how we'll put it together. But that will be the first thing that I think it's essential. Excellent. Well, let's ask Kemi about it, although I'm sure if we ask her whether um, physical activity would be helpful. She'll say too much sport is barely enough. But anyway, <laughs> let me ask you anyway, Kemi. Um, Camelia has, has contacted you and said, you know, um, we'd like to organise some activities or particularly some physical, physically based activities for the kids. Is that a good idea? Do you think that's going to help their psychological recovery? Absolutely. I think it will. I think um, based on what Camelia has said, you know, creating that sense of, of um social connectedness and we know that in Australia you know sport is a huge part of building those types of relationships it's also something that they would have engaged in maybe prior to um, the most recent natural disaster you know uh, things might have started to come back to some sense of of their normalcy and then it's been taken away again so I think the sooner we can introduce those types of activities it's going to not only help the uh, children but you know I think we're also acutely aware of people like Jimmy, you know, they're thinking about their children and maybe what they're potentially missing out on. So we're adding to their level of distress uh, or, or there is potentially a heightened level of distress for people like Jimmy because they are so concerned about, about their children and the children of the community and wanting to stay and build the, the community sense that they had when they were children and, and potentially grew up in that area. So that kind of social networking is very important. What about the the the, um, the physical aspect of exercise? Is that um, helpful in, in recovery and burning up some energy? Yes, yeah, <laughs> absolutely helpful in terms of managing levels of distress, managing obviously any of their emotional or mental health, um, you know, overall creating a good sense of well-being um, is, is really important. And for school children, particularly for children in, in um, Alice's age, it's a really key time where they start to develop that love for exercise, knowing how their body moves, um, you know, really understanding uh, movement itself. And that has big implications for their future physical activity behaviour and also just management of, of symptoms and setting up really good healthy patterns um, and physical health. Okay, thanks. Um, Penny, I'd like to bring you back in because... Um, Community, and my guess is that everyone knows everybody else's business. So you're seeing a, a patient one day and she says that she's really worried about Betty, about Jimmy's wife, Betty. Um, does this raise any issues for you in terms of sort of confidenti confidentiality and boundaries and so on? Uh, or, or would you feel comfortable just raising it with Betty next time you see her? Um, look, it does raise issues and it depends what she said. If um, if she just mentions that she's um, feeling uncomfortable um, and doesn't go any further, then that makes it a lot easier. Um, if I see Betty on a regular basis, that makes it easier. If Betty comes in, I can sort of gently um, progress with her how she might be feeling. 
Um, and, and we do that all the time in general practice. So I would be, during this time, I would also be outreaching to patients that we thought were vulnerable as well. So not just Betty, but other patients. So our elderly people, our people that we know that are more anxious originally. And we'd also be outreaching to um, patients with physical conditions, so diabetes, because they'd be deteriorating. But absolutely, there'd be no reason not to, um, but we do have to do it very carefully. Well, you do raise it with Betty, and um, she the floodgates open, basically. She gives you this litany of problems that she hasn't really told you about before. They're, they're under a great deal of financial stress. Uh, there's tension at home. The kids are fighting. She's worried about Jimmy. Jimmy has become withdrawn. Um, she's really, she really does seem to be at her wit's end. Um, is there anything that you can offer her? I mean, soul GP, you're up to your ears in, in work. You know, is there anything you can do? Are you going to give us some medication? Or? Well, not, not initially for, by any chance. Um, no, look, what I can give her is time. And, and we found that in previous disasters that every consultation takes 10, 15 minutes longer. And so I would be able to give her time and listen, listen to what her issues are, what she's feeling. Some of them will be old issues that haven't been addressed that have been brought up by this new distress. I could also normalise what's happening for her. She's gone through this horrendous event. This is making things more difficult to cope. I can also help her understand how she might be able to move forward um, in terms of general health and also in terms of um, focusing also on what she has, which is useful. And I would probably want to get her some support if I was concerned about her. I wouldn't go straight to medication by any means. Okay, well, something that you know, but she hasn't really raised it, is that her mother was um, admitted to a nursing home at the beginning of the pandemic. And a year ago, beginning of 2022, uh, the nursing home was hit with a, a blast of, of COVID and several residents died, among them her mother. Uh, in the months leading up to it, people weren't, she wasn't allowed to visit her mother and she knows her mother felt very lonely and abandoned. Do you think that there might be some grief issues to work through there? Um, absolutely. And having experienced the same thing myself, <laughs> definitely. Um, and I think a lot of people experienced that. And I think that was um, one of the really difficult issues around COVID is that fracturing of the community and, and increased isolation of those that were most vulnerable. So absolutely, I think that could be an issue. You're very fortunate because you happen to have an expert in loss and grief as part of the State Disaster Recovery Plan. Are you, is it okay? Are you going to suggest that Betty maybe gets in touch? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Good, good. Well, Chris, she does. Betty gives you a ring and says that her GP has asked uh, her to ring you. Um, loss of a loved one is, is, you know, is, is always a difficult situation, but are there factors in this case that make it more difficult for her to process that loss? Well, well there's no question. Uh, and again, we need to contextualise all these losses uh, in the light of everything else that, that's taken place. Um, certainly, uh, we know that deaths in aged care facilities in particular, where there's not been opportunities to be present at the time of death, to, to, um, to be able to engage in perhaps uh, funerals or other sorts of rituals, have, have been um, deeply troubling. But again, we want to get a full picture um, and uh, I, I, I tend to take a position of not knowing in relation to, to other people's experiences and, you know, for her to teach me what is, is the most difficult aspect and I may be surprised by that. Um, but certainly uh, there's an important part there of setting some context around, um, around those sorts of experiences of loss. I think often, um, and I hate to use the word normalising, but providing a kind of a, a framework for understanding the nature of those losses. Again, her, her concerns might relate to her children, how they've been managing that experience. There might be relational difficulties. People tend not just to come with a, an experience of bereavement. Um, they come correct. with a whole range of, of, of other concerns as well. Quite, quite. And you mentioned the children there. As it happens, Jason and Alice were very close to their grandmother. Would you potentially have concerns about them? Not necessarily concerns. Um, I think one of the, the important messages is we need to overcome our desire to protect children, that children in the absence of information will construct meaning and often uh, that, that meaning can be unhelpful. But I'd be wanting to know uh, that, that somewhat of the nature of that relationship, how they've managed that. Um, we also know that children will often put their grief on hold until mum and dad are okay. Um, and so we'd also be kind of wanting to know what they might have observed um, in terms of their behaviour, their uh, their adjustment. Again, it depends on the nature of the death. Was it particularly sudden or unexpected? Had it been foreshadowed in some way? What was the nature of that relationship? Mm, sure, sure. Okay, thanks. Um, 
Neville. Um, the fire service, as we've said in Janesville, has been through a huge amount recently. Um, what kind of programs have you put in place, if any, to, to assist the team in recovery? Um, yeah, we, we would have been involved probably if we were invited. We don't impose ourselves on people. Um, uh, we uh, respond to requests to, uh, to work with brigades. And that, so there may have well have been some, some assistance put in place. Uh, if we go back a couple of years ago, there were fires. Perhaps there might have been livestock lost and uh, connections established with people. Uh, I know that um, uh, it's certainly been the case over a number of years that uh, the peer support program does get involved in some of the broader local initiatives. Um, but back to the, the firefighters themselves, uh, focusing on, on, on them as people, as individuals, as I said, they won't all be responding the same to this sequence of events. They will be affected differently. Um, some may be farmers who've lost livestock. Um, some may be tradespeople. Um, some may be professionals uh, working perhaps at the, the secondary school uh, in the next town. So they, we've got a real mix of people here. Um, and uh, some of them may have sought assistance some of them may not. Um, some of them may appear to be okay, um, but be deluding themselves and not okay. But quite a lot of people who appear to be okay appear to be okay because they're actually okay. They're, okay. they're a very important resilient. point. Yeah. We shouldn't jump yeah. to conclusions just because they've been well, through this and must have problems. But let's talk about yeah. someone in particular, uh, Neville. Mm -hmm. um, you've known Jimmy for quite a while, and. Mm -hmm. He's not, I'm not no one suggesting he's falling apart, but you've noticed some pretty significant changes. He clearly has become more withdrawn. He's, he's started yeah. to drink more and so on. Um, it's very hard to raise these issues sometimes, especially with someone like Jimmy, but often easier just to sit back and hope it gets better. Are you going to say anything to Jimmy? Uh, what I would be, it would depend how I, as the, the coordinator of peer support in the area, have got to know Jimmy. And, and if I have over the years, then then I could make use of that. But it may well be that others are in a better position to interact with him, people that Jimmy trusts and knows better. Um, so, well, you do you do feel you're in in the position to talk yeah. to him. So you do yeah. you do just ask him how he's travelling, and um, yeah. obviously yeah. he's pretty reluctant to say anything. But gradually, as you chat to him over a coffee, yeah. a whole lot of stuff comes out, and he, he does start to acknowledge the fact that he really isn't travelling very well, that he's not sleeping yeah. well, yeah. that when he does fall asleep, he's getting nightmares. <clears throat> um, that that you know he, he he's. He feels that he can't help any. He can't help his family. He can't even help himself. So how can he help Betty and the children and so on? He's really not in a very good place. Um, what are you going to do? Uh, it, it's it's one of the things that that's hardest for firefighters to to deal with, whether they're a firefighter on the truck or a captain. Uh, there, there's a heavy load that captains carry because they they send their people into danger, and and you've explained that one of the firefighters has been injured. Um, and the worst thing is, is the sense of helplessness, hopelessness and inadequacy that can be experienced when events like this happen. Um, I think I'd be having a conversation along the lines of um, about how firefighters love to help people, but um, things can turn and, and it can be our time to receive help and, and have some conversations along those lines to, to work on opening Jimmy up to the possibility that yeah, maybe it's maybe it's my turn to receive some help. I'm the one who's been there on the football field and in the in the fire brigade, being there for everybody else. But just to try to open up a, a, a bit of a chink to um, get the possibility that well, maybe it's my turn to be on the receiving end of some help, and just see okay. see where we can go with that sort of line of thinking. Okay, so you've got a bit of a chink in there, but not much more at the moment. Uh, you know, he's he's going to take a bit more work in on, I reckon. And one of the issues for him is that he is absolutely terrified about confidentiality. Can you honestly put your hand on your heart and assure him that other people in the team won't know that, uh, you know, that, that it will be kept confidential, other people in the footy club won't mm -hmm. know? Yep. Look, it, it's an absolute cornerstone of what we do in peer support, the confidentiality. Uh, we, we couldn't run this program without that. Um, it can be hard to gain someone's trust. But um, it's such a fundamental plank of what we do. 
that um, I, I'd be emphasising that. And, um, and really, that's where I would hope that over these years of involvement, we've actually built up some credibility. Um, and, and we're careful about that whole question. And, uh, and we're very conscious that in a small community, it's not just the simple black and white confidentiality of blabbing to somebody. It's, it's indicating that, that you've been talking to somebody when you'd have no other reason to talk to them, to them through the peer role. So I would hope that over this last couple of years, we've established that track record of, of confidentiality um, because we have been around for a while. Fair enough. Okay, good, good. Um, Rob, can I just bring you in quickly to comment on stuff that Neville was saying there, and in fact we've been picking up. Um, th this idea that Jimmy um, that Jimmy feels he's not really functioning in any kind of role. He's, he's not a good father. He's not a good husband. He's probably not doing very well at work. He doesn't think he's a good good uh, captain anymore of the, of the fire service. This loss of role, is that important in helping to understand his um, his, his mental health problems? Yes, I think it's very important uh, because probably that's the tip of the iceberg. He probably had feelings of failure and helplessness during the fire, particularly the, the, the nightmares would indicate that to me and the withdrawal would suggest he's got such a lot on his mind and he doesn't want to be exposed to other people, shame and that sort of thing. Um, I, I can remember on one, one community after Black Saturday who were very worried about their fire chief actually went to the trouble of organising a whole evening meeting to talk about natural reactions, basically just for him, because they knew that if they got the whole community to come and they all sort of shared their concerns and they set this up, and he actually came along and he listened and I uh, had a long talk with him afterwards and I think he went and got a bit of support. I also wouldn't hurry it. I'd wait really the, the time for him to come forward. The one other thing I would do is I would uh, see how we could offer him other forms of support. I'm thinking of financial counsellors uh, for their financial problems and uh, maybe support for the kids to sort of just give him a sense that uh, he, he doesn't have to shoulder all of this. Mm, sure. Okay, good. Um, I'm not sure that he's ready to take that support yet, but we can do our best to, to offer it to him. Let's talk about another avenue of support, Kemi, and I would like to apply the blowtorch now because um, this is a rural footy club. Do you think that he's going to, this is a place he's going to be comfortable talking about mental health problems? Is he going to get any support from his mates down the footy club, realistically? Well, I think it depends on what kind of level of support we're, we're talking about. Are we, are we talking about, um, you know, the them being touch points for him, you know, that, that regular check-in of, of people that can notice a series of change of behaviour, so that withdrawal and can really highlight maybe some concern. Are they people that he would have talked to about his problems or, or, or um, stresses in the past? And then as um, I think it was Rob said, um, you know, having people there for support in places where people would normally gather, I think remove some of the barrier where he may be willing to go and talk to someone. If you've got people around you that are all engaging as the perfect example before, you know, in, um, you know, psychological first aid or, or at least talking about how to recover, you know, and, and implementing some of those things, then I think, you know, they are the right people to be, to be monitoring how he's going and, and really I, I, creating I, that I, sense of community. Look, I, admire, I do admire your optimism, but I can't help thinking that he's going to be pretty reluctant to tell his footy mates that he's, uh, he's got mental health problems. But anyway, I rely on that for a moment. But let me just follow it on because I also have a, a hypothesis about um, the, the, the two children also play footy at the footy club. Um, do you think that the attitudes of the older players, for example, about being tough and macho and, and perhaps, you know, not countenancing weakness or mental health uh, issues, do you think that filters down to these younger players as they're starting to play footy through the club? Absolutely. I think if, if they have, um, you know, particular perceptions, I think given that he's a role model in the, in the football club, if he has that sort of perception of, of, of you know, he has to be tough, then that, that narrative will filter down into to the younger players. Um, and whilst he is a tough nut to crack, um, you know, people often open up when they start to move their body and it isn't just about having a conversation. You know, as we start to get people to exercise and do physical activity, often they'll start to talk about topics that they maybe wouldn't have talked about if they were just in a one-to-one -one seated, um, I guess, scenario. 
Mm. Okay, fair point, fair point. Um, Penny, let me bring you back in. Um, Betty has told you that she's worried about Jimmy. She said that he's um, he's not sleeping, he's irritable, he's losing his cool, he's shouting at the kids and so on. It's very, very unlike him. He's drinking too much. Uh, he's withdrawn. It's, it's, it's very, very unlike him. But he's a bloke and he doesn't go and see the GP very often. It's extremely rare that you'll see Jimmy in your surgery unless there's something really bad. Uh, is there anything that you might try to do to try and engage or do you even want to try and engage him? Um, absolutely. And and I would be very keen to re-engage with him and with the whole family. Um, so I would still want to be seeing, even though I've sent Betty off, I'd want to be seeing her regularly and I'm then able to touch base with all the other members of the family. But the thing with Jim, what we often do is we often use a physical health um, reason to come in. So it might be um, that Betty can suggest that maybe he comes in and has a bit of a checkup or he hasn't had his cholesterol done or he needs his blood pressure done. These are also really, really important things because he may have, he may actually have hypertension. He may be at high risk of a stroke under these conditions. These are things that we see following disasters. So there's actual physical events that um, we need to be cognizant of the world as well. So I would use those as an excuse to bring him back in and then see if I can touch base with him. As, as a way in. Okay. Well, there's a few of you sort of chipping away at Jimmy there. Neville's done a bit and uh, and so on. Uh, and, and you do that as well. And look, there is a definite chink. He is, he is beginning to get to the point where he thinks he might discuss it. Um, you, you're fortunate in having um, an expert psychiatrist on tap uh, as, as a result of the State Disaster Recovery Plan. Um, are you going to contact uh, contact Andrew, do you think? Yeah, and look, in the first instance, I might actually just ring Andrew and mention this, mention Jimmy and say, what do you think? You know, he may not be ready to come and see you yet, but I'm going to continue to follow him up with whatever excuse, um, follow up the results. Um, if he is ready, then that that's obviously an option. But sometimes we hold patients for a while as GPs and we see them several times and go through um, various stages before we actually get them referred on. But absolutely, I'd be on the phone. You'd be on the phone to Andrew. What do you think, Andrew? Is that um, w Would you be willing to provide that kind of, what do we call it, secondary consultation to Penny, perhaps in the early stages? Of course I wouldn't. And I'd be saying to Penny that I love the way that you're approaching this and trying, sort of spending time trying to build rapport uh, which is so important to engage people in their own treatment. He's not going to get better if he's if he's there under any kind of duress, um, whereas if he's engaged in his treatment, no matter what's wrong with him, whether it's hypertension or whether it's PTSD, um, his chances of getting better are significantly enhanced. So I would say leave him with you, build trust. And, and if Penny builds trust, Penny might be the person that's going to be best for him. He might like to see a psychiatrist. That's a big step, I think, for someone that's someone like Jimmy often. I work with people like Jimmy every day. Um, and often they would prefer to be rolling up at the GP practice than rolling up to see the shrink. Well, that's true. So the idea of seeing a shrink scares the willies out of him. At the same time... There's a little part of him that would rather see a bloke, to be quite honest. And uh, Penny does a fantastic job with him. Um, but he does get to the point of saying, well, you know, I, I wouldn't mind having a chat to Andrew. Um, you're going to have to see him on Zoom. Just, you know, a very, very quick response to this. Uh, we've all had to get used to doing telehealth and seeing patients on Zoom, a whole different ball game. Uh, are you OK with that, comfortable with, with doing assessments or, or, or treatment on Zoom? Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm very comfortable with that. It's, it's something we've all had to get comfortable with, as you say. And in fact, I've, I, like a lot of my colleagues, and, and certainly a lot of allied health professionals that provide mental health uh, support, have, I think, been pleasantly surprised with, um, with how good it's been and how effective it's been. And certainly it helps address a lot of access issues that help, uh, in terms of time, as well as distance. Um, so very happy. I think it's much better than the phone because they can see you, they can see how you respond. Importantly, I can see their nonverbals as well as their verbals, and it just allows just that one step better connection than, than just talking on the phone. So if he's happy with that, I'm very happy with that, and we'll see where it goes from there. Well, I'm not sure that he's happy with it, but he's willing. So he comes along, and you have a couple of sessions of, of assessment and so on with a view to perhaps... Uh, engaging him in treatment. Um, I know it's difficult because you've only seen him a couple of times, but have you got any ideas off the top of your head what your first priorities are going to be for him? 
So the first thing I'm trying to do um, is build a connection to, to try and engage him in his treatment, to try and build some kind of uh, ther therapeutic rapport and trust in that, that I might know what I'm talking about. And one way really to do that is to, to be able to talk with him about what he's going through and and demonstrate to him that I might be aware of some of the things that he's going through and be able to normalise a fair few of those things. I think a really important thing is that I say, look, it's, it would be normal to come in your position and having been through what you've been through over the last three few years, but really having just had one of your own men critically injured in a town-based or community-based very traumatic event, that it would be normal that you're struggling at the moment. And in fact, if you weren't, I'd be almost more concerned about you. So let's hear, you know, why don't you let me know what's going on? Um, here are some of the things that I might expect that you might be feeling in a time of psychological difficulty or distress, things like sleep problems, things like irritability and anger, things like avoidance, things like relationship difficulties, things like um, reactivity in the household, increasing your use of alcohol, you know, getting a little bit of anxiety if, if, the, if the phone rings for the fire service again or if someone's trying to engage you from a professional point of view. So just trying to sort of build rapport that way. He has all of those. He has all of those. Um, he's seeing a lot. Of, there's a lot of people involved in this case now. You know, we've got Penny. Uh, we've got Chris seeing, seeing the... Um, seeing Betty perhaps we've got Camellia looking after the kids we've got Neville involved um is there a, is that an issue that there's all these different people working on this case are you going to try and pull everybody together big job uh that can be an issue particularly if um if there's not a consistent message being delivered across the board uh and that can very much be got around by um appropriate communication between different treaters and often the hub for that isn't actually me often the hub for that is the very important gps that are just so good at that at, at just uh, brokeraging out and keeping on um on top of what's happening with different people uh within that uh, family unit so i would be uh certainly communicating closely with penny and if i felt there were specific things around certain issues involving others i'd be i'd be happy to call them or receive calls from them as well okay good all right well you see him for a few sessions you continue your assessment and eventually you you come up with a formulation and you come up with a diagnostic picture where you think he's probably got ptsd with some associated depression and and substance abuse as well or some alcohol uh, abuse but the good news is that he's engaged with you and it looks as though he's going to hang in there and, and, and he's going to let you help him Chris, if I could just bring you back in very quickly, um, Betty is still not travelling terribly well. In the DSM-5, um, albeit it's in the um, conditions for further study, we've got a new, condi a new condition called, um, what is it, prolonged complex bereavement disorder, what we used to call complicated bereavement. Um, you know, is there a place for that? Is, is that something that might help us better understand Betty's reaction? Well, the, late, the latest TR version actually it has included prolonged grief disorder as a condition. So that's moved from the ah. conditions of interest. Um, and, and it parallels also very closely the ICD diagnostic criteria for prolonged grief disorder. So what we're looking at there is, uh, again, a, a bereavement that's lasted for at least 12 months, uh, six months in the case of children and adolescents, where there's really quite profound disability, high levels of distress, um, and again, we've now got some very effective you know, treatments for prolonged grief disorder that have been uh, uh, trialled and are, are well established. But so this, we're talking, if, about, sorry. yeah, we're talking here about you know, probably less than ten percent of the bereaved population, and of those who have prolonged grief disorder, only twenty percent just have prolonged grief disorder. Most also have either a major de depressive disorder, an anxiety disorder, or PTSD. So it's reasonably unusual to see somebody who just has uh, prolonged grief disorder. Okay. Um, so it, it, is, it, it sounds as though it, it does have some validity, some use in a clinical setting. And 
uh, we're not simply pathologizing normal grief, which I suppose is what, what people are slightly concerned about. That, that's right. And, and there's been a lot of debate about that. I, I, you know, I'm actually quite comfortable that there is actually a, a very clear um, proportion of people where something has derailed that very normal adaptive process of accommodation to a, a significant bereavement. Sure. OK. Neville, Jimmy is very angry and uh, he blames the rural fire service for his condition. Uh, he's talking about um, suing them for negligence, for not providing a safe workplace. Are you going to encourage him or discourage him in that pathway? Uh, I wouldn't be either encouraging or discouraging him. I'd, I'd be focusing on supporting him in his the circumstance that he finds himself in. Whether he sues the CFA or not is 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 off to the side from me. Um, uh, and there may be other things that sit behind that, that desire uh, for him to do that. And uh, he, he may be frustrated and angry. And there may have been actual lack, lack of support or there may have been perceptions of lack of support. Um, but um, I'd, I'd be focusing on being there for Jimmy in the circumstances he finds himself in. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be um, encouraging him or discouraging him, but supporting him through whatever course of action he follows. Fair um, enough. Okay, so we'll, we'll, yep. yeah, we'll come back to that in just a second. Just mm -hmm. very quickly, yep. um, who, Rob? Just in a, in a word or two, would do you think it's good for Jimmy to be pursuing legal action? Look, it may be very important for him to uh, clear some some things in his own mind, uh, which he holds responsible. But uh, what I say to people who are, are considering this, I say, please remember that going to court is not necessarily a means of getting justice as you see it because it, it it's a machinery for administering the law and the people who have the cleverest lawyers often win the case mm. so i'd say by all means take legal action if you feel that's justified but don't pin your recovery on that your emotional okay. recovery is quite a separate thing you may or may not get satisfaction for court but don't make your emotional recovery depend on it yeah, can okay. do that, I'd say. Otherwise, it's probably not going to be good for your health. Sure. Um, Andrew, just very quickly, you're, you're actually seeing Jimmy. Um, very quickly, do you have a view on, on whether this is a good idea or a bad idea? So I would be saying to him something pretty similar to what Rob said. Um, I would also be balancing that with, uh, with evidence from... from all the studies that have been done around the world that compensation or, or looking for compensation or compensation issues tend to worsen the prognosis. So in other words, your outcome will be affected probably almost certainly in a negative way by this. And there are a lot of reasons for this, um, but also it will probably prolong disability for you. Uh, these processes never happen quickly. It should just like, you know, if you're looking to address a situation with a specific um, treatment, if you like, you've always got to look at um, pros and cons. So you've got to look at um, what's its therapeutic value versus what's its side effects or adverse outcomes, adverse effects. And, and really, in many of these work-related or compensated compensation-related cases, um, you know, that... Ultimately, the outcome is worse for the person than it, than it would have been if they just tried to let it go through other 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 things. Yeah. Well, that's all very well for you to say, Andrew. He has been chatting with the plaintiff lawyers, and the lawyers are geeing him up. They reckon he's really got a good case here. But you might be interested, Neville, to know that the lawyers think that um, that that the, the a central plank, the central plank of the. Rural Fire Services Mental Health Response is the peer support program. So these plaintiff lawyers are geeing Jimmy up to say, you should make the peer support program the central target of your claim. Do you have any reactions to that? Um, I, I assume that that's, that's implying in, in, in a negative that there wasn't enough peer support provided. I'm, I'm not, not quite sure what how he, that all, all fits what together. What he's saying is he didn't do the job. 
It didn't right. stop him. Okay. It didn't stop him from getting PTSD. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, not something I've encountered. Um, and the I'm not sort of talking back to something Andrew said before about that. Uh, the importance of consistency of messaging and and normalising, and there would have been a consistency there because that's uh, a certainly part, a key part of what uh, we would have been doing is is normalising uh, for uh, for Jimmy that the responses he's experiencing are um, a normal response to the very abnormal sequence of events that's uh, occurred there. Um, so um, let me let me just put a bit more pressure on. Um, yeah. If he does proceed, and we don't know yet whether he's going to, but if he does proceed. Almost yep. certainly, you'll be called to give evidence. You're the you're the coordinator mm -hmm. of the whole region. Um, yep. Just in broad terms, do you think that you would be um, giving evidence to suggest that the R rural fire service has failed in its duty of care to Jimmy, or would you be saying that Jimmy should have taken more responsibility for his own mental health? Yeah, I'd be probably ramping things up a few few, few levels above my volunteer pay grade to uh, seek advice on that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, good, good, good. good. I think um, it's very actually, yeah, yeah, and 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 I would anticipate that that uh, in the fire service that I'm part of, that there there would be support um, for me in my role, and um, and and Jimmy's still entitled to peer support in in his role, um, and we'd we'd be doing the best there. It, it may test the relationships, but um, there it is. And uh, when lawyers get muddled up in things. Um, um, it can get very tangled and twisted. Well, that's right. We, we shall see what happens. Jimmy is still considering his options. As I say, he's getting conflicting advice from people like Andrew and uh, and so on, and his lawyers, on the other hand, saying, come on, you could make a substantial amount of money out of this, Jimmy. He's considering it. He's, he's, he's mulling it over, so so we shall see. Camellia. Yes. You um, asked to provide a bit of support to the high school in the next town, which is where Jason goes. And they've asked you to see Jason, have a chat to him. He's, um, he's not travelling very well either. He's, he says that things are very tough at home. Dad's really difficult to get on with and so on. Um, he's having trouble settling into the new school and so on. Um, so these are all things that you'd kind of expect. But then a few sessions in, once he trusts you, out of the blue, he admits to you that he's having sexual thoughts about other boys in the school. How, how are you going to react to that? Or what are you going to suggest for this young man? I would just probably allow Jason to talk to me about what those thoughts are. At the moment, they're just thoughts. And it is not uncommon for children at that age to actually really try to work out their sense of identity and where they fit. Um, so I will just provide the space for Jason to continue to feel safe in trying to bring out whatever is coming up for him. Mm. It's interesting that you use the phrase there to feel safe, because if I can bring Kemi in again, um, Jason tells Camellia that he doesn't feel safe in the football club. In the footy club, terms like gay and faggot are used as insults. There are constant jokes about homosexuality. Uh, he's probably justified in feeling a bit unsafe in the footy club, isn't he? As far as I know, we've got no openly gay AFL players, despite the size of the league. We've got one or two NRL players. Is he justified in feeling a bit frightened about the fact that others might find out? Absolutely, he's justified in, in, in feeling, you know, that it's not a safe place. And, you know, uh, that is true for not just him, but lots of lots of people that grow up in, in potentially rural towns or in this um, in sporting clubs that have, I guess, maybe a very traditional sense or, um, you know, in the club. And I think he's completely justified. Um, how we change that is, is another question altogether. Ah, pity, because that was my next question. <laughs> so the footy club kind of, they, they, they realise that they've got a bit of a problem with the culture here. And so they ask, they're, they're asking whether you would be willing to come in and do some work with the club around culture, which might involve mental health. It might also involve um, attitudes to issues around gender identity or whatever. Um, is that, would you be willing to do that? 
I don't know that I would be the best person to do all of that. I could certainly facilitate it as part of my role within the football club. But I think that there are other people that have skill sets, particularly around that messaging that we could bring in to be involved in the creation of those programs. I wouldn't see it as, 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 as my role specifically as an exercise physiologist. In and terms you- of creating values and, and, and um, creating a safe space, there's definitely ways that we could do that and help participants to come up with what they would envision a safe exercise environment would be and try and influence it that way uh, as another way within my own scope. Do you, as a matter of interest, do you think it would work? It's hard. I think in the, in the ideal world, uh, you know, it's great to say that it, it's really inclusive. But as you pointed out, Mark, you know, there aren't any openly gay um, uh, or, or anyone that identifies as maybe gender diverse in our current sporting, in our national sport. Um, so I think it is hard and I don't think it's going to happen overnight, if, if, if at all. Mm. Yep. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. Um, Andrew, back to you. In your discussions with Jimmy, he admits that from time to time he thinks that life is not worth living. It's not too surprising. But he also says that he thinks that Betty and the children would be devastated if he did any harm to himself. And so he says, sometimes I think about just taking them with me. And as soon as he says that, he says, oh, but, but of course I wouldn't do it. Um, what are, you gonna, are you gonna act on that? Is that, is that a concern? Is there, what, what are your options there? Okay, so when, well, first of all, I need to assess, this is questions around risk. So I need to assess his, first of all, his risk to himself and then his risk to those around him, his loved ones. So, and the way we tend to do that is we assess how much they're thinking about it, how much they're preoccupied by it, the frequency and intensity of those thoughts. Then we ask them about have they got, do they get times where they feel a strong urge to to carry out or to plan some of those things? So, you know, have they got a... Are they, are they planning ways in which that would happen or have they thought about ways they could make that happen? Then have they engaged in any behaviours to access means by which to carry that out? And all of this needs to be based on um, a knowledge of his past history in terms of his, if he's ever had these thoughts before and if he's ever done anything with regards to risk to himself and risk to others. So um, I'd be interested in terms of we know that in rural communities and and particularly in rural communities where there's been cumulative trauma or increased angst um, that there is increased rates of domestic violence so i'd certainly want to see if i could find out through collateral sources or through him if this has been an issue but i wouldn't be acting on it to, to answer your question directly i wouldn't be acting on it straight away i wouldn't be um you know, ringing the police and um, and warning all his family straight away. I think that we need to engage in some kind of dialogue and I need to flesh it out more. Um, perhaps you might talk to Penny. Um, Penny, you have had some concerns for a while about Jimmy and domestic violence. Um, there, there hasn't been, as far as you know, any physical violence, but you get cl- a clear picture from Betty about an escalating level of verbal aggression um, and it crosses your mind. And when you talk to um, Andrew, you know, it sort of adds another piece of the jigsaw puzzle. What about you? Do you think you would want to act on it? Um, Look, I really agree with Andrew in that I would, um, you know, if I had the opportunity to talk to him, I'd want to know more about it, flesh it out more. I'm seeing Betty regularly, so I'd probably want to flesh it out a bit with her as well. Um, I would... um, you know, in the background, while this is all going on, I'm also concerned about the daughter who's not yet had much help, so no one's seeing her. Um, but, yeah, look, I think I would want to consider it very seriously and I'd want to um, hopefully continue to touch base with him, but I wouldn't be making any calls as long as I was happy with um, the conversation that Andrew had and that I'd had with him around the fact that he, you know, was um, probably unlikely to do it. The thing I would also ask is, you know, what's stopping him from doing it, you know, well, what's stopping him from considering that, you know, and often people will say my children, I'd never do it because of my children. Um, so I think that's also useful. Sure, sure. Although in his case, he's talking about taking the children with him, but still. 
Yeah. So what we'll do perhaps is some some watchful waiting. We'll keep a close eye on him, as Andrew says. We'll do a very detailed um, assessment about about the risk and so on, so that we can come to some kind of um, some kind of judgment. All right. Well, um, I'm afraid that our, our time has run out, and we need to um, draw this hypothetical uh, to a close. I I'm pleased to say that things are improving in Janesville. Um, the the community is showing some good recovery with the help of Rob and and various others. The um, the McCoy family is doing relatively well. They've got lots of support from various people in the community. Things are beginning to settle. The children are settling and so on. So things are looking pretty good. Jimmy is slowly improving, but he's got some pretty serious problems. Um, he's by no means completely recovered. He still would definitely meet criteria for a diagnosis of PTSD. Uh, as we heard, he's still considering the possibility of launching a legal action against the Rural Fire Service for negligence. But while he's considering this, he um, he strolls into town one day and he goes into the news agents and completely on a whim, because he's never done this before, he buys a midweek Powerball lottery ticket with a jackpot, $10, $10 million prize. And amazingly, he wins the jackpot, allowing us to answer that age old question, will a large amount of money really cure PTSD? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, look, as we uh, as we leave uh, Janesville and the McCoys, uh, I would like you to metaphorically join me in thanking our magnificent panel, um, Rob Gordon, uh, Penny Burns, Andrew Koo, Camelia Wilkinson, uh, Chris Hall, Kemi Wright, and Neville Goddard. Thank you so much to all of you. I can hear the applause resounding around Australia from here. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much to MHPN for uh, organising it and indeed organising the whole conference. And thank you very much to JT Productions for the tech side. And most importantly, thank you very much to you all, to our participants uh, for joining us tonight. Um, I hope that you found it valuable. I hope you find it useful. And I hope also that you enjoy the rest of the conference because there's some amazing stuff in the program. And I'd particularly like to draw your attention to the plenary session tomorrow night at six o'clock on Wednesday, Wednesday 29th, um, which is going to be looking at the nexus between mental health and climate change, taking a deeper dive to uh, some of the stuff that we've looked at tonight. Please um, stay online for a minute and complete the evaluation if you could. And, and when MHPN send you one for the whole conference, do that too. I know it's a pain to fill in evaluations, but it's really important for us. So if you could do that, we'd be extremely grateful. But at this point, again, I'd like to say thanks very much to everybody. I've enjoyed it. I hope you have too. Thanks very much and goodbye to all.